spend some of your money to take Krim 210 C900. You can hear my dog. He's also very excited by squeaking his mallard duck. And so today we're going to have a, a short lecture for this week. I'm just going to touch on what the expectations of this class are, who I am as an instructor, what my expectation is of you as students, what my teaching philosophy is. And then we'll talk a little bit about where we get information on young offenders from. To start everything off, I'll just introduce you a little bit to the course. And we have a really unique situation here. So not only are we in the middle of the pandemic, but this is a C900 class. It's not your typical run-of-the-mill online class. In the past, the C100 classes, you would basically have no instructor involvement. You would have a TM that's there to mark your assignments and answer questions that you might have. C900 classes are much more instructor-led. All of the lectures will be from me. I'll help facilitate some of the discussions and you'll really hopefully get a more immersive experience and get to understand really what I'm trying to communicate about youth that are in conflict with the law from the practitioner side of things, so whether you want to be a police officer or probation officer, from the legal side of things, so if you're interested in the justice system as Crown Counsel, Defense Counsel, and so on, or if you're interested in grad school, you're interested in the research side of things, you want to know how come or why individuals who are youth engage in specific types of crimes, and why these individuals do or do not continue to offend in adulthood. I'm so bored I cut the ponytail off the guy sitting in front of us. Look at me, I'm a grad student. I'm 30 years old and I made $600 last year. Bummer, don't make fun of grad students. They just made a terrible life choice. So I'll start just with the nuts and bolts of everything. Again, my name is Evan McCush. Normally you can find me in my office at 10215 Saywell Hall, but for the purposes of this semester, all of the office hours that I'm going to have are going to be held virtually. So I'll do one session of office hours that's synchronous. So I will get on Zoom at a specific time and you're welcome to join me to ask any questions that you have. And then I'll also have asynchronous office hours, which means on Canvas there will be a specific discussion thread where you can post questions that you might have in that particular week. And I will answer those questions during a very specific time of the week and I'll post all of this information to Canvas so you'll know when you can expect a response. So if you have more of like a back and forth question that you want to pose to me, much better to come see me during the synchronous office hours. But if you have just like a general question, you can just reach out to me on Canvas and I can answer that question and that way other students can see that information and so we might be able to help other students answer the same question that they had as well. You can also reach me for questions by email. If it's a very simple like yes or no question, just send me an email at ecm2 at sfu.ca or evan underscore mccush at sfu.ca. Fun fact, SFU gives you two email addresses that go to the very same account. This can be useful, so if you have, you know, like a free one month trial on Spotify or something like that, now you can get two free months on Spotify because technically you have two email addresses, although they all go again to the same spot. So we'll talk now a little bit about my background. So my background, like most professors, is in research. So I run a longitudinal study of youth that they were incarcerated as an adolescent and then are followed up through adulthood. So we interviewed about 1,700 kids in the province of British Columbia who are incarcerated. And the study started in 1998. And so we've been following these individuals over time. So some of these individuals are now 40 years old. So we're trying to understand what is the risk factor profile of a serious and violent adolescent that continues to offend in adulthood. 
but then also what are like the protective factors associated with adolescents that do not continue to go on to offend in adulthood. So we're trying to basically understand why do some of these youth continue to offend at a really high rate or commit really serious offenses and some do not. What we're also interested in is not just the offending outcomes, but social outcomes. So of the 1,700 kids in our sample, over 100 are actually now deceased by the age of 40 years old. The most common causes of death are suicide, homicide, and drug overdose. So we're trying to understand which individuals are at risk of experiencing sort of early mortality. We're also interested in which individuals get married. Is it a positive relationship? Sadly, we're finding that most of the male participants in our study who do engage in intimate partner relationships actually come under the contact of the justice system for the perpetration of domestic violence or intimate partner violence. So this is really concerning because in the past, criminology has told people things like, oh, being married can be a protective factor against crime. Samson and Love sort of famous researchers from a life course perspective, so that marriage was a turning point. What we're seeing is that marriage is not a turning point for a lot of individuals. In some case, they're using it simply as a, not using it, but they begin to engage in intimate partner violence because they're married. I'd say that the research area that I most heavily focus on is psychopathy. And that's sort of been my passion over the last 10 years is to understand what are the features of psychopathy among adolescents and do these features lead to continued offending through the life course? So I was involved in sitting down with youth one-on-one, -on -one, doing interviews with them in an isolated part of the custody center where we could have these really confidential interviews and ask kids who've been involved in really serious offenses including gang-related homicides, sexual homicides, sexual offenses, violent robberies and try to understand whether they present the strong features of psychopathy. So are they callous and unemotional? Do they show a lack of remorse for their behavior and so on? So this is one of the major themes that we'll focus on in this class is sort of the assessment of psychopathy amongst youth and the fact that kids do change. And I think this is really important to communicate. I've interviewed kids who presented the strong features of psychopathy as an adolescent, but in adulthood it appears that some of these features have gone away. So we are seeing the capacity for individuals who show involvement in serious and violent offenses to actually change over time. So the course material for Crim 210 is going to be heavily based on my experiences interviewing these kids who have been incarcerated in Canada. So I place a great deal of emphasis on research and empirical evidence. We need to make sure that our ideas are not ideologically driven or politically driven our ideas should be driven by the evidence before us. And so as I mentioned, I really want students to learn the difference between someone's opinion or a theoretical perspective or principle and empirical evidence. So we need to be able to read whether research is actually supporting the theories that we get exposed to in different criminology classes. I mean, because we have Crim 101, 103, 104, 210, 300, the list goes on of crim classes that focus on theory. But I find that textbooks don't do a very good job of explaining to students which of these theories are actually valid, which of these are actually informative of who will or will not offend. And so part of the emphasis of this class will be on teaching students how to read empirical articles. If you've taken a class with me in CRIM 103, then you'll be a little bit ahead of the game. But the expectation is by the end of this course, students will be able to not just like look at a empirical papers abstract, they'll actually be able to read the entire paper, understand the key information, and understand what this paper has to say about the validity of a particular theory, and what the limitations of that paper are in terms of the reliability of the conclusions or the generalizations that they can make from that paper. I can understand that being a lot more fun if I just come up and each week I talk about kids that I've interviewed and what they were like, and what it's like to interview somebody who's committed a homicide, psychopathy, kids who present with schizophrenia symptoms. I get that this is a maybe more engaging material, but especially in first and second year classes, my goal is always to try and think forward. I want to set students up so that they can be really successful in the more hands-on, discussion-based third and fourth year classes. So the idea here is we need to, in the first and second year, give you the tools 
to be able to really dive deep into the topics that you're most interested in. So that's kind of the aim of this class. So what exactly do I mean when I'm talking about empirical evidence? So Principal Skinner is able to help communicate this to Bart, but Denzel Washington is much better at communicating empirical evidence to his partner. You got one problem though, Jake, you got no witnesses. Who are your fucking witnesses, huh? Roger? Smiley? You think my troops are gonna help you? It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. Yeah. What can you prove, huh? Nothing. Where's your evidence, huh? It's right there. Mm. For many of you, you've never taken a C900 class. And so understanding how things differ a little bit compared to prior classes that you've taken is really important. Most importantly, we're not on a specific daily schedule where you show up between 2.30 and 4.30 and that's when the lecture happens. The C900 whole purpose is to have flexibility for students. So all of the lectures are asynchronous. This means that I will always, by about like 11.59 p.m. the week before, I will upload a lecture for week one, or week two, week three, and so on. So it'll be your responsibility as a student to watch that lecture at some point during the week. When you watch it, it's up to you. If you want to watch it at 3 a.m. on a Tuesday, it's not what I would recommend, but if it works for you and your lifestyle, maybe you you know, you know, work long shifts, or it's normally you work evenings, so you're up late, whatever, it doesn't matter to me, as long as you're watching it, and as long as you're engaging with the material and participating in discussions. So to access all of this information, you're gonna to have to be familiar with Canvas. On Canvas, I will post my lecture slides. I will post links to my YouTube channel where these lecture videos are available. And then I will also embed my media site page where you can do two things. Sorry, where you can do three things. You can stream my lectures. You can download the video and audio of my lectures, so it's a podcast. Or you can just download the audio of my lectures in podcast form. Like, I don't know. Hopefully you've got a better taste in music, but if you don't know what music to listen to and you decide that you've got a long bus ride and you just want to plug in your AirPods and listen to me speak in a monotone voice for an hour and 10 minutes, you'll be able to do that. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's your option. And that's kind of the idea with this class, is to make things very flexible for the student. One of the things to know about my lecture slides is that you can open them up directly on Canvas, but you should not do this because it will cut off whatever, for whatever reason, Canvas won't display smart art very well. So you'll miss a lot of the font that's in my lecture slides. So make sure you download my lecture slides to your computer and then open them up. When you see a red font, that means that the information presented will not be on the exam. So sometimes I like to go on tangents or talk about material that is sort of too in-depth to expect CRIM 210 students to really know and memorize, but I don't want to hide you from this information, especially if, if you're really interested in this topic. I want you to be able to go and learn more about it. So I will try and give you more information, try to make it a little bit more in-depth of a discussion, but when it's in red, it means that, that material will not actually be on the final quiz. So that's how you'll access lectures. There's another component of the course which involves your discussions. Unlike in-person classes where you're in a physical classroom, tutorial discussions for this class will all be online via Canvas. And like the lectures, they will be asynchronous. So it will be your responsibility to engage in the discussion posts and the discussion questions during the week that the question is posted. So I'll post the question Sunday, 11.59 p.m. And in between Monday and then following Sunday at 11.59 p.m., you'll be responsible for providing your thoughts in response to the discussion post. And so 10% of your grade is based on your participation in discussion. Another 10% is based on your professionalism in discussion. So the professionalism refers to things like 
using appropriate grammar, phrasing, but also how you interact with students. So we will be sharing ideas and other students might have ideas that are different from yours. And it's okay to disagree with your fellow students about those ideas, but it always has to remain a debate about the idea and not the debate about the person. So you have to focus on the ideas, what they're saying and not who they are, not using personal attacks or using insensitive comments. The idea here is to treat the conversations that you have online the way that you would treat a workplace conversation. If you were sitting in a boardroom, how would you interact with this person in a professional way? So that in total will amount to 20% of your grade. Another important portion of your grade, I think it's 45% of your grade, is based on the completion of three short papers. These three short papers will allow you to focus on different aspects of youth justice, including risk factors for why youth become involved in crime. That's paper topic number one. Paper topic number two is about youth justice laws and policies, things that you think should be changed or laws that you think should be changed and why. And the third paper topic is about youth justice practices and practitioners. So whether you want to focus on defense counsel, crown counsel, a youth probation officer, a police officer, totally up to you, but you'll think about how this individual would engage in best practices to promote the safety of public and to help prevent future offending. These are the three short discussion papers that you'll submit throughout the semester. See the syllabus for the due dates. Towards the end of the semester, students will pick one of the short essays that they've written and they will present on that short essay to the rest of the class. So these will also be asynchronous. What will happen is during the specific week that you're required to present, you will upload a video presentation of your term paper or your essay. Which essay you choose is entirely up to you. So you can present on any of those three topics. Whichever of those essays you want to present on is up to you. You will most likely simply record your voice over top of PowerPoint slides and then upload that. And we'll have links for you to upload. This will all be explained to you as we get closer to the date. But essentially, it will allow you to help get feedback from other students about the paper that you've written, their thoughts on it will get a little bit more discussion amongst the students that are in your tutorial. There is no midterm exam for this class, but there is a final exam. The final exam will cover all the material from week one through to the very last week of class. I'll have a final week of class dedicated to a review for the final exam so that students will have a better understanding of what they can expect the exam to be on, the structure or format of the exam, and so on. So what will happen is the exam questions will be uploaded to Canvas as a quiz and students will complete the exam on Canvas. You will also be required to log into Zoom and you will be recorded while you complete the exam. So you will have your camera on, your microphone on, and you'll complete the exam there. The exam, however, is going to be open book. You are allowed to flip through tabs on your computer. You can have your notes typed out on, in a Word doc. You can have a whole binder full of notes. Whatever you want to do to prepare is totally up to you. There's only one rule of the final exam, and that's that you are not allowed to communicate with other students. So you are not allowed to be seen holding a cell phone at any point in the exam. You cannot have another student in the same room as you. You cannot talk to another student, whether it is over you know, group chat or whether it is just like audio, like talking to them on the phone. So that's the only rule, which I think is gonna be fairly fair. It'll give everybody a sort of even playing ground. You can all basically quote unquote cheat in the sense that you can look through all your notes, textbook material and so on. It's just that you cannot actually communicate with other students. SFU is responsible for setting the final exam date, so I don't actually have the date myself. I don't know the date. Keep your eye on Go SFU, and that will give you the date for all of your final exams. So that's the basic structure of the class. You'll be graded on your discussion posts, 
your three short essays, your presentation of one of those essays, and then the final exam. Now we'll take a look at the themes that will be covered in the course. And we're gonna proceed through the material in kind of like a linear fashion. And so we're gonna start by looking at historical perspectives on youth, dating all the way back to essentially like Adam and Eve in the garden. And we'll get an understanding of how have we over history and over time viewed the nature of childhood, the nature of adolescence. In fact, in the past, there was no distinction between childhood and adulthood. So we'll learn about distinct ways that adolescence differs from childhood and that adolescence differs from adulthood. Then we'll look at more sort of early theories on youth offending and then move into contemporary theories and perspectives on why youth engage in criminal behavior. Once we have an understanding of sort of the risk factors and the theoretical perspectives on youth offending, then we're going to look at the magnitude of youth crime. How prevalent is it? How prevalent are certain crime types? Is crime on the rise or not? Are specific types of crime increasing? And then we'll look at how the youth justice system responds to these crimes. So we'll trace Canada's history from basically 1908, when it had its first youth justice system, all the way to now the 21st century. What does youth justice in Canada look like today? The final last sort of three lectures in the class will focus on the responses to youth offending by different criminal justice system practitioners, including probation officers, police officers, and the justice system, specifically the courts. Sprinkled in throughout the semester, I'll touch on some special interest topics. It might be a psychopathy, it might be gang involvement, but hopefully you'll find these are interesting key topics that we'll want to know about for understanding youth offending in a more nuanced manner. And so finally, the last theme for this little short lecture for this week is on where we get our information on youth offending. And you'll notice in this class, I really try to avoid using the term young offender. Like there's been a lot of debate especially on academic Twitter, about the labels that we use and how the term offender can be harmful. And the best explanation or best justification I've heard for why we should avoid the term like young offender or juvenile offender is the idea, and I'm not sure who initially came up with this phrase, but they said, why would we call someone the thing that we do not want them to become? So why would we call someone an offender when we're trying to get them to not offend? So that's why I'm not perfect. I'll often slip back into sort of the common phrase of saying young offender. But I try to say youth offending as opposed to young offender to avoid those negative labels. The project that I work on is called the Incarcerated Serious and Violent Young Offender Study, which obviously is not the best title of a project based on the information that I just said. But this project was started in 1998. It's the title of the project and it actually can't change because SFU ethics does not allow us to change the titles of these projects. So the study began in 1998 and it's Canada's largest and longest running study of youth in conflict with the law. Approximately 1,400 individuals participated in the interview. There was approximately 1,700 individuals in the study overall. And the primary aim of the current sort of focus of this study is on looking at multi-domain risk factor approach to the identification of pathways to offending and from offending to non-offending. And what we're really realizing is that criminological theory has been way too simplistic. When we think about Godfrey and Hershey, they talked about low self-control is all you need to be involved in crime. Social learning theory really just focused on who a person associates with. Labeling theory just focused on formal and informal responses to behavior. All of these theoretical perspectives are way too simplistic to begin to understand serious and violent offending by youth. And this is because these youth tend to have such a wide range of risk factor profiles. To quickly tell you a story, this is one individual. It's not a particularly extreme case. It's just a case that I was recently familiar with. There are many individuals just like him. He was born with FASD, so his mother was drinking while she was pregnant. Didn't know his father. He had a negative relationship with his mother and a negative relationship with his younger brother, who was also in conflict with the law. By the time he was 13 years old, he was already placed in youth custody. He had lived in about 30-some-odd foster care facilities prior to that period of time. 
So we moved in and out of these foster care facilities, engaging in delinquent behavior with the kids, especially older peers that he met in group homes. He began using alcohol at age four. He began using ecstasy at age 13. By the time he was about 25 years old, clinicians were really concerned that he had placed himself in drug-induced psychoses because of his use of crack cocaine. He had engaged in 26 different offenses by the time that he was finished adolescence. So between 12 and 17, he had 26 convictions for different crimes. Nine of those offenses were for hands-on violent crimes. While in custody, he had many different incidents, like he was in custody for four months, and he had 19 different incident reports written about him for fighting with peers, threatening staff, exposing his genitals to staff, and so on. As he entered adulthood, things didn't get much better for him. In fact, he had a sort of a negative interaction with one of his friends, and he was feeling very angry. He saw a man at a park, sitting on a bench, having a coffee, and he was laughing and smiling, so he walked up to that man and stabbed him in the leg and ran away. He basically thought that that guy was just too happy. He didn't like that he was happy. There was no provocation. It wasn't that he said something to the guy, and the guy said something back to him, and there was an argument, and then he stabbed him. He just walked up to that individual and stabbed him because he didn't like the way that he looked. If we just focused on the offense and didn't focus on his back, we would have a hard time understanding, like, how could somebody ever commit this type of it seems so horrific, so unplanned, so unprovoked. How does something this random happen? We will look back at his developmental history, we can see, well, when you have FASD, you have very poor executive functioning, poor planning, poor frustration tolerance, severe use, daily use of drugs like crack cocaine, crystal meth, heroin can induce somebody into psychosis. In fact, clinicians were worried that he was developing some severe psychosis because he thought that people were out to get him, that they were always watching him, that his grandmother was stalking him, and so on. We have a very clear progression from his 13-year-old self engaging in a lot of forms of violence, usually in response to provocation or because he didn't like something that other people did, all the way up to in adulthood, he's now just engaging in violent crimes because violence has traditionally been his way of solving problems and dealing with his emotional stress. So that's just this one case. We're trying to really understand all 1,400 of these cases so that we can have a better understanding of how to prevent serious and violent crime. So in terms of who participated in the study, any kid that was incarcerated in the Burnaby or Victoria Youth Custody facilities were eligible to participate, and this included both boys and girls. So this is something that's really unique about the study is that we interviewed girls as well. Traditionally, criminology has done a really bad job of addressing the development of offending by girls. We've usually just focused on boys. What was very interesting about doing these interviews is that basically everything that we talked about between myself and the youth was confidential. So we would sit in a room, no staff, no microphones, nobody can hear us, and we would have conversations conduct an interview about the youth's past. And if they told me things like they had killed somebody and got away with it, they were protected by that level of confidentiality. So it was very similar to like a lawyer-client level of confidentiality. I only had to inform somebody about the youth, what the youth said, if the youth made a direct threat that they were gonna hurt somebody, or they made a direct threat to hurt themselves. Things that they had done in the past always all remained confidential. So I'll take some time to go through what it's like to meet a youth in the custody center and talk a little bit about the common risk factors that we observed through our interviews with youth. So the chart shown here basically just outlines the prevalence of different types of drugs used by the sample. And we can never even really examine, for example, whether alcohol or marijuana were risk factors for future offending. And the reason why is because almost 100% of the sample actually used alcohol or used marijuana. So you can see that even when we look at more serious drugs like crack cocaine, crystal meth, and heroin, the prevalence is quite high. Those three taken together, about 50% of participants in the sample had used one of crack cocaine, crystal meth, or heroin. And these are 15, 16 year old kids on average. Mental health issues were another big issue for the sample. We can see that almost every single kid in the sample had some form of mental health issue. 
Some of the more common ones were attention deficit hyperactive disorder, depression, and what was also interesting is that when we look at the family of origin, especially for girls, about half of the sample had a family member with a mental health issue as well. One of the, while we're on the topic of girls, one of the things that we found that's really interesting from an academic perspective is that when we look at risk factors, the girls in our sample were much more high risk than the boys in our sample. What that means is that if we look at the prevalence of mental health disorders, if we look at the prevalence of abuse, if we look at the prevalence of the use of specific types of drugs tended to be higher for a girl. Yet, when we look at offending in adulthood, we found that boys were much, much more likely to continue to offend in adulthood and offend at a higher rate when compared to girls. So girls are higher risk, but offend less than boys. What this tells us is we might need to rethink some of our risk assessment tools and the instruments that we use in the justice system to figure out what a person's level of risk is, because we could very well be overestimating the level of risk for girls. What the literature is telling us is that girls might have these risk factors. They're not risk factors for offending. They're more like risk factors for self-harm. They're more like risk factors for homelessness, experiencing abuse or victimization from others. One of the saddest things to learn during the interview was about the participants' family up so many different ways in which these kids have experienced physical abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect. Like some kids, they would have their mother would boil water in a tea kettle and then pour the water onto a spoon and then make their child drink the boiling water from the spoon. That way it would burn their throat, but social services wouldn't be able to detect that they were abusing their child because the injury would be internal. They wouldn't be able to see sort of inside their mouth down and into their throat. So very, very awful ways in which these individuals experienced abuse. Had some kids who were, grew up in refugee camps in Africa and they saw their mother be sexually assaulted and they come to Canada and they themselves perpetrate a sexual assault. So a lot of really sad cases. We can see that these individuals, a lot of them experience leaving home by their own choice and leaving home at an early age and leaving home often. Or they've been kicked out and they've been kicked out often. So they're very often out in the street and li living in the street, being homeless, or what we would say is no fixed address, NFA, or couch surfing. And it can really open them up to experiences of victimization because nobody is out there protecting them. We especially find that girls were likely to use crystal meth, not because they wanted to like experience the adrenaline or the, like the ecstasy type effects, the stimulation types of effects, because they, you know, they wanted to drink and party. Some of them were using crystal meth so that they could stay up at night while they were on the street. That way they didn't fall asleep and then experience physical or sexual victimization. People will look at individuals on the street and think, oh, and I'm not suggesting you think this, and I'm, I certainly don't think this, but there could be a stigmatization of people see somebody on the street as a substance user and wonder like, why don't they just change their behavior? And for some, it's survival. It's not for fun. It's not because they like using drugs. The school-based behavior of these kids was very, very poor. They were very often in trouble at school for disrupting classrooms, assaulting students, assaulting teachers, using drugs and alcohol at school, bringing weapons to school, and so on. So most of these students had dropped out or they had to change schools a number of different times because they were getting into trouble or they were moving, especially we had about half of our sample in foster care. And they move around all of these different group homes from city to city or neighborhood to neighborhood. And what that does is it pulls them out of one school and puts them in a different school. And this makes it very difficult to sort of establish some roots in a neighborhood, establish some attachments with teachers. Teachers don't even get to know the kid long enough to care about them, to be looking out for them. And this school-based attachment can be actually a protective factor, but these kids tend to not be able to experience this beneficial effect of school because they're very often getting into trouble at school, being kicked out, and they're required to move. As I mentioned, Physical and sexual abuse were common for the sample, especially for girls. One of the things that I would also argue is that for boys, 
the prevalence of sexual victimization is underestimated because it's something that they just did not want to talk about. They did not want to have to have a conversation about their experience of sexual victimization, who victimized them, how often, and so on. So one of the things that we maybe don't have a good understanding of is the sexual victimization experiences of boys and whether this relates to their involvement in crime. And I said like whether this relates to their involvement in crime. And the reason why I say this is because it's very important to distinguish correlation from causation. One of the things that we know is that there's a very strong overlap between victimization and offending. Most people that experience physical victimization or sexual victimization do not go on to engage in criminal behavior. So it's really important that we understand that so that we don't stigmatize people that have experienced physical and sexual victimization. However, for people that are involved in crime, they're very often the victims of crime as well. So we need to understand this link. Maybe physical and sexual victimization don't cause crime, but being involved in criminal behavior can expose people to a risky lifestyle that might place them at risk for victimization as well. There's a hyperlink on the slide here. If you just open up the slide and click it, you'll be able to get to our ResearchGate profile that will tell you more about this particular project. I also have office hours if you have any questions or want to know more about the study. And if you are excited to learn more, don't worry, we'll be talking about this more throughout the semester. So next week, we're gonna be talking about historical perspectives. And students can find this maybe a little bit drier or maybe just unexpected. Why are we talking about history in a criminology class? But I think it's incredibly important to understand where we came from and how this is constructed where we are. We are a product of history. And so understanding how youth have been perceived over time, I think is very, very important. One of the things that I would say to be aware of for this particular lecture and for all my lectures, I will never on the final exam ask you about dates or the specific names of people or unless I explicitly say in the final exam review percentages. So especially for the history, uh, history especially for the history lecture, don't worry about memorizing dates. I'll provide some timelines for you so that you can kind of get a frame of reference for when things are happening. I'll ask you about specific eras but I'll never ask you for the exact specific date. What I really want students to understand is the evolution of perspectives on youth, how youth have been treated under the law over the course of our history, and why these views are held. That's much more important to me than memorizing the names of specific figures or specific dates. So I hope this is getting you excited for the class. I hope to meet all of you during office hours. We'll have some great discussions for this week. Hopefully you'll take the time to introduce yourselves and I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. I hope you choose to stay in this class. So have a great rest of your week, everybody.